to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and descended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, May 21st, we are studying Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 to 70. In today's text, the people of Israel who returned to Jerusalem and to Judah after Cyrus's decree are listed and are numbered. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor Philip Fishaber. Pastor Fishaber serves at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Pastor Fishaber, welcome to Sharper Iron. Thank you. Great to be with you today. Glad to have you on the program for the first time, Pastor. As we get started today, talk to us about some context. What should we know about the book of Ezra uh, leading up to chapter 2? In 2 Kings, we get the history of the decline and destruction of Judah. And so the people are carried into exile after repeatedly turning away from God, ignoring all of the prophets he sent to them. After 70 years, the people are permitted to return to the land. And Ezra is the beginning of the story of that return, the rebuilding of the temple. And so... Ezra is the new start for the people of Israel after their punishment in exile and the rebuilding of faithful Judah and Jerusalem after hundreds of years of wicked kings and wicked people leading up to the destruction of the first temple and the end of the Judean monarchy. So... Now we are under the rule of so, Cyrus, the Persian, who defeated, after the Medes and Persians defeated Babylon. So he is giving the people of God their new start in the land of Judah. So that was the text we looked at yesterday, that we are in that context. The first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the first year of his reign over Babylon, that now allows the people to go home. In yesterday's text, we saw how the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And in today's text, we're going to hear the names, the numbers of the people whom God stirred up. He also stirred up the spirits of his people to go back to Judah and Jerusalem to rebuild the house of the Lord. And so today we're going to hear about the actual people that went there. Now, Pastor, we have a very long text today, and it is a a text when you, you look at it that Perhaps you wonder why it's in the scriptures. It's one of those that when you come to chapters like these, if you've been reading through the Bible, these are the ones that sometimes are discouraging. It's a long list of names. So talk to us about the the place of chapters like this in the whole. Well, I don't think they're likely to make the list of anyone's top 10 favorite chapters, but they really are very important. (laughs) Sometimes people talk about the Old Testament like God just appears and does a miracle, or like Jesus is only present in as the object of prophecies. But God is the one giving the prophecies, he's caring for his people, he's calling them to repentance, he is constantly active in the Old Testament, in the life of his people, in ruling the world. We confess this in the explanations to the Apostles' Creed in the small catechism. God created and daily sustains. The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies us. And so this chapter is a reminder that God really does care for us. He knows us by name, he's numbered us, and he is actively caring not just in some big picture sense from 30,000 feet, but each individual matters to God, and that should be a great comfort to readers. I appreciate what you you said about the way that sometimes we think about the Old Testament, 
sometimes as a series of maybe disconnected stories that, you know, God shows up here, he shows up there, but otherwise I'm not always sure where he is or he doesn't seem to be active. Chapters like this, and really, you know, much of the book of Ezra, in which you you hear about sort of just the the day-to-day lives of the people of God, that is a reminder that God is at work in that part of history as well, even in ways that aren't as obvious as, say, you know, we just studied the book of Daniel and Sharper Iron. You know, when, when Daniel was saved from the, the lion's den, that was very obvious the Lord was at work. Or when, when the three young men were saved from the fiery furnace, it was very obvious that God was at work. Here we've got a list of names, and like, what's, what's going on here? Here, the, the scriptures do show us that in just the day-to-day lives of his people, especially as they're returning home from, from exile now, he is active. We talked a little bit about this yesterday in the introductory episode, that this is one of the ways that, that Christ is preached in the book of Ezra, is, is that we see how the Lord is at work through all this history that to bring his Savior into the world. And so while a chapter like this, as you said, might not be on our top 10 list of the, the favorite ones to read, it is a significant chapter in the Scriptures and one that we should take great comfort in to know that, that God cares about the lives of his people with such great detail. Maybe talk a little bit more about that thought, about the, the level of detail of care and love that the Lord has for his people here. Sure. So there's a long list of names. Some of them are the officials. We get family names. We get city names. But a lot of these wouldn't mean any more to a lot of people than if I were to start rattling off the towns around me. Because these are not all major cities. This is not Jerusalem, Lachish. It's the royal family, the great officials of the kingdom. These are the ordinary people. These are just who happens to be there. And while... We might not get excited about hearing how many thousands of people make up this. The fact of the matter is God knew the names of all 42,000 who made the whole assembly, besides all the other officials who make 7,537. We read in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. If God cares for each of those nearly 50,000 in such great detail, that he has not only them named and numbered, but the very hairs on each of their heads, then certainly we are important to God. All of his people are important to God. I appreciated the comparison that you offered where imagine if you were to start listing off the towns that are around you. Uh, before, before, or when I saw you were a guest on the, the program, Pastor, I, I did look up to find out where Walnut, Illinois was so I had an idea of, of where you are. But, but you're right. If you started to list the towns around you, I would, I would not know those towns from, from the next one. And if you started to list the people in your congregation, or if you were to say, this is the point of comparison I like to use for these chapters, if you were to, to look at the page in your bulletin that lists the servants for the day, you know, who's your elder for the day, and who's your acolyte for the day, and who's your, who's your altar guild for the day, and... You know uh, what's the the social the social ministry team doing? I mean, all all those various groups within our congregation that have names attached to them, I wouldn't know who they are, but you would, and and I would know the people from my congregation, even if you wouldn't know them. And and the joy, one of the joys of being a pastor, and one of the joys of just being a part of a Christian congregation is at the beginning when you get to a place, you don't know those people, you know their names, but you don't know them, but you get to know them, and you get to to re- enjoy and re- rejoice in the fellowship that we share within the Christian church. And so while, when those, you know, as you get to know those people, the, those names become more than names, then that, I think that idea gives us a sense of the way we should approach a text like this. You know, no, I, 
I may not know the names here. I might not know how to pronounce them all the time. But these are the people of God to whom I am united in Christ. And for that reason, uh, a list like this brings me great joy, just like a, you know, the list of the servants or the, the list of the directory of a, a congregation is going to bring me great joy because I know those people and I know that I'm united to them in Christ. An excellent point. And building on that, having your name recorded is so very important. After the disciples go out and perform great miracles, Jesus tells them, don't rejoice in any of the things you did. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And I don't know how many times in Revelation we get mention of the names written. Ezekiel has them recorded too. And so, yes, we have this list here, but it's not just a church directory or bulletin even. It is that God has written their names in the Book of Life. These people, and you, listener, are his, and that is a great and glorious comfort. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So again, a, a chapter that perhaps is a challenge for us to read, but a challenge, a challenge that is worth taking up, because this is the Word of God written for our instruction, for our increased faith in Christ, ultimately to point to Him as our Savior. Let's go ahead and and just read this chapter. There's maybe a couple breaking points. We'll just see how it goes. I'm going to start working my way through this list of names, the people whom the Lord stirred up to go home to Jerusalem and Judah. So this is Ezra chapter 2. Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and to Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Abana, the number of the men of the people of Israel the sons of Parosh, 2,172, the sons of Shephatiah, 372, the sons of Ara, 775, the sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 945, the sons of Zakai, 760, the sons of Bani, 642, the sons of Bebai, 623. The sons of Osgod, 1,222. The sons of Adonikam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2,056. The sons of Adin, 454. The sons of Atar, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bezai, 323. The sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashum, 223. The sons of Gibar, 95. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Netepha, 56. The men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Osmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Arim, Kephariah, and Baroth, 743. The sons of Rama and Giba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Harim, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Sana, 3,630. The priests, the sons of Jediah, of the house of Jeshua, 973, the sons of Immer, 1052, the sons of Pashur, 1247, the sons of Harim, 1017, the Levites, sons of Jeshua and Kadmiel, of the sons of Hodaviah, 70, the singers, the sons of Asaph, 128, the sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatit and the sons of Shobai, in all 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, 
the sons of Hasapha, the sons of Tabaoth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Siaha, the sons of Padan, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shamlai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Riaya, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Pasia, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Meonim, the sons of Nephesim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harhur, the sons of Basluth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkus, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Neziah, and the sons of Hatifa, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasapherath, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokahereth, Hazabiam, and the sons of Ami. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Melah, Tel Harsha, Kerub, Adon, and Immer, though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, and the sons of Nakoda, 652. Also the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, and the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Barzillai the Gilead and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there, and so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were 6,720. Some of the heads of families, when they came to the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God, to erect it on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priests' garments. Now the priests, the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their towns, and all the rest of Israel in their towns. That's our text for today. That's Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 to 70. All right, Pastor, we're not going to look at every single name in this list, but there, there maybe are some names that stand out, and, and as we consider the list as a whole, again, there's, some, there's a lot of important things that we can see. One of the things that we see, I think, here is, and you pointed this out in your notes, is we see how God cares for his people as a nation. Uh, help us to, to see that theme from chapter 2. Sure. So it can be very tedious to read through all these names, but these are the assembly of the Lord who are brought back according to God's promise. There are various statements that I refer to as creedal statements in the Old Testament that are repeated over and over again about God throughout the Old Testament and also the New Testament. One of these historical statements is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Over and over again, this mm. is one of the principal ways God refers to his relationship with his people. We got a twist on this in Jeremiah, speaking shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, As the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country, and out of all the countries where he had driven them, for I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. 
And so this is mm. God fulfilling that promise. And this really is the mm. second exodus. They are carried not by ten plagues and a mighty hand and outstretched arm to defeat Egypt and other enemies and be delivered from Egypt, but in what is many ways a greater show of God's might, he moves the heart of Cyrus, who Isaiah tells us doesn't know the Lord. Nevertheless, God moves his heart to send his people back willingly and freely and to support the restoration that he foretold by Jeremiah and other prophets. So I was just going to point out, Pastor, that yesterday in chapter 1, you're bringing up the prophecy of Jeremiah. That was mentioned, that this is in fulfillment of what Jeremiah had foretold. And the I think that the pattern of God's action that you're pointing out is, a, is an important one. So he, he sets that pattern of deliverance in the Exodus. He brings his people out of slavery. And Jeremiah foretold that this return from the exile would be a new exodus. I think you see a, a similar theme and proclamation, especially in the latter part of, of the prophet Isaiah, where he, he too speaks of the return from exile in terms of a new exodus. So the Lord has a, a pattern by which he acts, it seems, in history, and he, he tells his people that this is the way he's going to act. So he, he told his people, this is who I am. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. He, he tells them again, I'm going to bring you now out of exile. I think if we think about that pattern, we can carry that then into the New Testament. And, and my mind at least goes to especially the tr account of the transfiguration from the Gospel of Luke, where we find out specifically that Jesus is on the mountain of transfiguration, and he's talking to Moses and Elijah about his exodus. It's sometimes translated departure in English, but it is the word for exodus, so that both of these big acts of salvation in the Old Testament, the exodus from e Egypt, the return from exile, set that pattern that God fulfills and makes, yeah, fulfills and, and, and does to its fullest by sending his son to die and to rise and to bring us on that exodus. So there's the, the pattern carried into the New Testament as well. Yeah, our Easter hymns really bring this out because Jesus was crucified at the Passover festival, which is the final plague where God delivers his people. And so we have not the exodus from Egypt, not the return from exile, but we have God's even greater victory and deliverance through Jesus Christ at what was the greatest Passover ever on Good Friday and Easter morning. Yeah, there are a number of beautiful connections to the account of the Exodus from Egypt found in our Easter hymnody. It shows up in historical Easter preaching and probably in our preaching still today that the Exodus that God accomplished from Egypt has been fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see similarly that the return from exile has also been fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to bring us out of the exile of our sin, to bring us to our homeland. He does so by stirring up our spirits as he did for these exiles in Ezra chapters 1 and 2. He stirs us up to faith in himself through the work of the Holy Spirit. We are going to keep looking at those people who received that gift in Ezra chapter 2. More on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Philip Fishaber this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. 
LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, May 21st. We're studying Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 to 70 with Pastor Philip Fishaber. He serves at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Pastor Fishaber, prior to the break, we were talking about the way that the Lord acts here in Ezra chapter 2 in bringing these, his people, out of exile comes from the pattern that he set through the Exodus, which you have pointed out to us, shows up in a a creedal statement in the Old Testament. This is how the Lord identifies himself to his people. This is how his people confess him. He is the God who has brought them out of the land of Egypt. And so he shows that to them again by bringing them out of the exile. We were talking about some of the connections to the Easter preaching and the Easter hymnody that we have today. What about in the New Testament? How does this, this theme show up? It's a very popular theme, and in Acts 13, we find it in Paul's preaching at Antioch in Pisidia. He's recounting the work of God and leading the people to say, and all that God has done is fulfilled in Jesus. And so in Acts 13, 17, he says, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm he led them out of it, and for about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness, and he continues on through a brief history of the Exodus, then goes to David and John the Baptist before getting to the great fulfillment of all the Old Testament in Christ. And he says it is precisely because he has done all these things for our fathers that we should now believe in Jesus and receive him as our Lord. And Paul is not the only one to do this. Stephen preaches a similar history. Paul does this elsewhere and numerous other New Testament books repeat the same message that God has done all of this Mm. and now he has done the greatest act of his mercy by giving us the Messiah to die and rise for our salvation. Now as we as we look at the text from Ezra chapter 2 which we read earlier again there are many many names lots of different numbers some of those, and I, again, we're not going to look at every single name, but some of those names do stand out and maybe warrant just a comment here or there. One of them, in verse 2, one of the names that's listed there is Nehemiah. This is not the same Nehemiah who bears the name of the book that we will study after Ezra. That Nehemiah comes chronologically much later than, than this Nehemiah. So there is a name that we recognize, but it is a different Nehemiah than the one that we know most often. Uh, you can see within this list that there are names both of individuals, there are also names of cities. Some of those cities perhaps are familiar to modern Christians more than others. So for example, you've got Bethlehem in the list, you've got uh, Anathoth, which is the town of Jeremiah, you've got cities like Bethel and Ai, which if you've read the book of Joshua, you may recognize from the, the time of the conquest. Uh, there are certain names that are that are in there, for example, among the singers, you have the sons of Asaph, which you might recognize from the book of Psalms, that, that the sons of Asaph are responsible for the composition of some of the Psalms. Uh, so again, throughout this list, uh, there are names that we maybe don't know anything about. There are names that we do know more about, mo- more about both of people and of places. Uh, feel free, Pastor Fishaber, to, to comment on any particular names that, that you'd like to, if, if you want, but I think one of the things as we consider the list as a whole, and especially when you think about the numbers, is that the numbers, uh, they're not as big as, as maybe we would think they were. Uh, you know, we got the total in verse 64, 
42,360, and then you get the officials that, that comes right after that, over over 7,000. Talk to us about the the numbers here a little bit and give us some some context as to how big they are and maybe they're why they're not bigger than we'd expect. These numbers are actually very small. If you compare the censuses in the Book of Numbers, this is smaller than some of the tribes. And so... We shouldn't look at this and say, oh, what a great and large number. We should look at this and realize that God is dealing with a faithful remnant. Now, not everyone who believed returned from exile, but this is a small number. One of those other great creedal statements is God repeatedly tells us, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and related to both that and his deliverance from Egypt, we read in Deuteronomy 26, at one of the feasts, the people are supposed to go and say, a wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation great and mighty and populous. And then Deuteronomy 26 goes on to keep talking about the deliverance from Egypt and the oppression they suffered there. Deuteronomy 7 brings this even into sharper focus. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people, that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And jumping ahead a little bit, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their faith those who hate him by destroying them. And so, this isn't the first time. God chose Abraham. That was one person. He chose his son Isaac, Jacob, and 72 people went down to Egypt and came out a great and mighty nation little over 400 years later. And God does the same thing here. He takes not 72, but nearly 50,000. But this is still a very small number to make up a whole nation and country. But because of his love, because of his promises given to Abraham, to David, to his people throughout the Old Testament, he brings them back despite how small they are, because God loves Mm. all his people. We have the great story of the lost sheep. Jesus says he leaves the 99 to go save the one. And that is God's level of care for Mm. us. Mm. I think that the small number of, of people that come back and and the way that the return as a whole seems to disappoint some of the faithful at the time we'll we'll read about this in the next chapter when they lay the foundations of the temple and those who had seen the the previous temple there's some there's some weeping because they realize just how how small and how pitiful this one looks compared to what it once was I, I think that like that, that disappointment that sometimes we we experience because it doesn't appear as great to us as, as we thought it should is is something that we do well to to see from this text and to take comfort in that as you pointed out from that Deuteronomy seven passage, it's not about us and our numbers. That's not why God loves us and, and cares for us. He loves us. <laughs> I, li- I like that passage from Deuteronomy seven because it basically says He loves you because He loves you. That's who God is, and and He is loving His people here in Ezra chapter two, even though it's a small number, because that's who He is, and that's what He continues to do. So that even when by outward standards 
we think, oh, that's a that's a small number, or or that's not as impressive of a building as I thought it would be. We would not lose heart because the Lord is still at work, and it's His action that determines what what the worth really is and and shows us where our salvation lies it's not in us or our numbers or in the outward appearances but it's in him and his promises and and what he's doing and so even though you know he's he's got a small number here he is going to fulfill that promise that he's made for example in the book of Isaiah that the nations are going to are going to run to his church and and they're going to need more room and he's going to give them more room i mean all those promises that we looked at from the latter half of Isaiah, uh, not too long ago here on Sharper Iron, he is going to bring to fulfillment, even though it seems awfully small right now. An excellent point. It's easy to be discouraged looking outside, to think of better days, and the people who didn't return lived in far better circumstances, more comfort, more money, Hmm. but God gives these people a spirit to go to do his will and he greatly blesses them for generations to come and we see the glory of israel yeah, I, I... in the time of jesus after he has sorry keep going we see the glory of israel and judah in the time of jesus after god has greatly blessed these people and brought to fulfillment the work started here by Ezra. They weep because the temple is small. By Jesus' day, the temple, after Herod expanded it, is one of the great architectural sites of the world. People are told, oh, you have to go see it because it's so glorious and wonderful. And we don't always get to see that. Ezra never saw the temple in such glory. But He was still greatly blessed by God and did a very important work, even though, as we'll read in the rest of the book, it was a very difficult and hard time that these people experienced. I think in in that way that there is the book of Ezra and Nehemiah as well, uh, both provide comfort to us as Christians, especially having recently come out of a, a pandemic and the way that that had such consequences upon, upon our society as a whole, and especially the worship life as, of the church. I, you know, I remember when when we were preparing first to come back to worship after there had been a time where people were were not coming, and, and we were going to have a, much more people together, and, and everyone was we were very excited, and it was certainly good to have everybody back, but at the same time there was that sense of oh, it's not like what it was. And, and it maybe wasn't as, as good as we thought it was going to be. Still, the Lord was among his people, with his word, with his sacrament. And those who were gathered, even if they were only two or three, were there receiving the fullness of his gifts. And again, in that, there is comfort, such that when it doesn't match up with our, maybe, quote, glory days, what brings the glory is the presence of God himself, and, and that's what counts. Very well said and a message that it is important to return to again and again. Now, as as we consider more from Ezra chapter 2 then, again, we've got this this list of names, the list of numbers. It's it's rather, again, small, as we've been saying. Uh, It talks not only about the people, the officials, we get some of the the animals and how many of the animals. I don't know if that's that's a lot of animals or not, Pastor Fishaber, uh, but the animals are also, some of the animals at least, horses, mules, camels, and donkeys are also listed. Uh, Just just thinking about how this fits into the the larger context of the, the scriptures, particularly as this continues the account of God fulfilling his promise to bring the Messiah into the world, Uh, How does Ezra 2 set the stage, again, for for what's to come, not only in Ezra, but looking forward into the New Testament and the coming of our Lord Jesus? Sure. So the very first name we get, Zerubbabel, is a descendant of the kings of Judah and an ancestor of Jesus. And so what's going on here in Ezra is, is the return is setting the stage for the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. In Isaiah 9, he foretells 
that the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, as Matthew explains to us, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. One of the beautiful Christmas readings. But that requires the Messiah to be in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zerubbabel has to get back to Judah so that Bethlehem Ephrathah can be the place where the Messiah is born. Jesus has to die outside of Jerusalem. God has not given vague prophecies. He's tied it to specific families, to specific locations. And so it is necessary for the people to return because Jesus can't die in Babylon. God said he was going to die outside Jerusalem. And so this is bringing back, resetting everything and setting up what's going to happen several centuries later when Jesus walks the earth and starts fulfilling these prophecies. And it's useful to look at the grand sweep of history and realize that God is directing it all and making this happen according to his promises. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that, that's something that when we read the Old Testament, we should always keep in mind. Dr. Adams, as he was going through this the book yesterday and, and kind of introducing it, he said sometimes we, we only read the Old Testament for those very specific messianic prophecies, and if we do that, then we may not appreciate a book like Ezra as much. It's when we recognize its place within all of the Old Testament and the way that through this God is fulfilling promises that he made, and he is doing what he has said. That's where the book of Ezra, again, points us toward Christ. This is God being faithful to his promise to send the Savior into the world. Now, within the, the chapter, there are a few things that are there in addition to the names and the numbers. There's a, a few people who are numbered toward the end that don't have the, the, or they can't figure out their genealogy exactly. In verse 62, it says some, connected to Barzillai, it says, they sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And that leads the, the people who return, that they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. They don't partake of the most holy food. Uh, what's going on here with this matter of genealogy and not being included in the priesthood because of it? Back in Exodus, and this is really flushed out in Leviticus, God gives the requirements for the priesthood. They must be descended from Aaron. And then the Levites are the men of the tribe of Levi, the relatives of Aaron. But not even Moses' children get to be priests, just Aaron and his descendants. And so proper worship requires the Aaronic priesthood to be properly functioning. And so genealogy matters not just for Jesus, but for the whole people so that they can say, yes, we have a right to serve in this priesthood bound by genealogical descent. And if not, then the people cannot faithfully let them operate as priests. Now, if anyone deserves it, Barzilla is a strong candidate. He was very faithful, helped David when he fled from Absalom, and is a great example of a faithful Christian layman. But... He wasn't a priest. Whether or not these sons of Barzillai who married one of his daughters and took his name because of how great and honorable he was aren't priests, then they have to follow their proper role because we don't get to worship God how we want. We worship God how he commands us to do. And in the Old Testament, that was much more specifically prescribed than it is in the New Testament, whereas Jesus says we worship in spirit and truth rather than on one specific mountain, and according to all of the prescriptions given in Exodus through Numbers. And so we should... And that I think that's an important thing to see 
I was going to say, this, I think that's an important thing to see here, that they're concerned about the genealogy, because as, as we'll see later in Ezra and into Nehemiah as well, there is, this, there is a, a concern among the people to be faithful to God's Word, uh, because they, they recognize they hadn't been so faithful, and that's the reason they'd been in exile in the first place. Mm -hmm. And taking this again to the New Testament, after Jesus' birth in Luke 2, his parents take him up to the temple to fulfill what is written in the law of the Lord and offer the sacrifice for a firstborn son, as prescribed in Leviticus. And so Jesus can't fulfill the law unless the temple is properly functioning. So once again, we see how this fits into that grand sweep of the Lord's history to bring his Savior into the world to fulfill his promises. Another, another note of something that happens in this chapter, again, and in addition to the, the matter of the numbers and names, is that when they get there to Jerusalem, there are offerings made, and it says they gave according to their ability. Talk a little bit about the, the offering that's received. Yeah. 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, 100 priests' garments. These are very sizable gifts. The people are not being stingy. They're not giving what's left over after they've paid for a long journey and bought supplies to rebuild and replant and start economic activity. They're giving according to their ability, but they're giving generously and giving their very best. This is a lot of money for 50,000 people to be giving. And so this is a sign of their faithfulness and their devotion to the Lord, that they are pouring out such lavish gifts for the temple and the priesthood because they really do believe and want to start setting things right and obeying the Lord and worshiping him rightly, as they should have done all along. You see there, again, another parallel, I think, to the Exodus account, after the people have been brought out of Egypt when they're at Mount Sinai and the Lord is giving the law, he gives instructions for the tabernacle, and the, the giving of the people at the time is very generous toward the the construction of the tabernacle. So once again, now that the Lord is delivering his people in response to his salvation, they respond with generous gifts toward the, the worship life. And, and similarly, similarly, God's people today give generously to support the proclamation of the gospel in thanksgiving for the salvation that he freely wants. I, I noted in verse 69 that, that they do this according to their ability. They're, they're what the Lord has given from that, they give freely to him to support the worship life. Paul speaks of the, the same way of giving in the New Testament that we would give according to our ability, according to the way that, that God has blessed us. Uh, we set aside a gift and, and return that to the Lord uh, for use in, in his service and in the proclamation of the gospel. So once again, the, the pattern that the Lord sets in his salvation continues, and so does the pattern of response of God's people to that salvation that the Lord gives. Uh, Pastor Philip, or Pastor Fishaber, we have about about a minute and a half left on the on the morning. Help us to wrap things up on this on this chapter, which maybe uh, wasn't the favorite chapter at the beginning, but hopefully has, has climbed the list a little bit. Help us to wrap things up on Ezra two. Well, as we've discussed already, it's important to note God's provision and care, and that it ranges from numbering the very hairs on your head to controlling the grand sweep of history. We didn't have time to talk about it, but Ezra sets up the events that are going to bring about other events to prepare the fullness of time, as Paul puts it, when Jesus is born and fulfills all of those prophecies. And so these names and numbers give us a grand sweep of God's providence, of his care for his people, and his care to graciously fulfill his promises that we would be saved. And that, whether long or short, many names and numbers or a very easy to read chapter, should always be a source of great comfort and joy for us. 
Pastor Philip Fishaber is pastor at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. He's been helping us today to study Ezra chapter 2, verses 1 to 70. Pastor Fishaber, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. It was great to be with you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ezra 2, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a joy to hear from you. Make sure you join us tomorrow to take a look at Ezra chapter 3. The people have come back. Now they're going to start the work, the work of rebuilding the altar and the temple there in Jerusalem. We will cover that and more as we look at Ezra chapter 3. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.